Hey, welcome back to Clean Cut, where we can talk about the truth about just about anything, as long as we use logic and common sense. This season, we're talking about arguments for the existence of God, and this time we'll discuss the argument from possibility and necessity. This is another type of contingency argument, so here goes. Premise 1. Everything that exists either has a necessary existence, or else it's possible for it to not exist. Premise 2. If it's possible for a thing to not exist, there is some possible state of affairs in which it doesn't exist. Premise 3. If it's possible for everything to not exist, there is some possible state of affairs in which nothing exists. Premise 4. Something can't come from nothing. Premise 5. Some things exist. Conclusion 1. Therefore, things which could possibly have not existed come from something with a necessary existence, such as God. Conclusion 2. Therefore, God exists. With an argument like this one, most of the premises are pretty clear. The real problem isn't proving the premises to be correct, but explaining why the conclusions follow from them. Still, let's look at the evidence for each premise in turn. Premise 1. There's not much about this claim that's questionable. When we say the term necessary existence, that means that it's impossible for it to not exist. Therefore, aside from things that have a necessary existence, everything might not have existed, so premise 1 is true. Premise 2. This is essentially a definition of what it means for it to be possible for a thing to not exist. If there weren't any possible state of affairs in which something didn't exist, its non-existence would be impossible. Premise 3. This is just an extrapolation from the last premise, applying it to everything generally. Premise 4. This is one of the most basic truths of metaphysics on which science is founded. Premise 5. This one is perfectly obvious. Just look around for evidence of it if you need some. Conclusion 1. Because of premise 2, we know that possibly non-existent things might not have existed, which means that the reason why they exist isn't immediately clear. If something has a necessary existence, then sure, it exists because it can't be otherwise. But that's not the case with non-necessary things. So unless you're going to claim that everything is necessary, an objection that we dealt with in episode 198, you've got to ask why anything exists at all. After all, if everything were possibly non-existent, then why would there be anything? Things that don't exist can't cause themselves to come into being because a non-existent thing doesn't have any potential. Since a necessary thing does have a clear reason why it exists and doesn't need to come from anything else, this problem can be solved by proposing a necessary thing which exists and causes other, possibly non-existent things to come about. However, just appealing to more possibly non-existent things doesn't solve the problem, because they also might not have existed. You've got to propose something with a necessary existence, since that's the only way that there could be any reason why it exists. Then there's no problem with saying that a necessarily existent thing can bring other, more limited things about. That, in turn, is what's meant by God. Conclusion 2. The second conclusion, therefore, follows from the first. This seems like a very good argument. What kinds of objections could be brought against it? Objection 1. The term possible to not exist is ambiguous. In premise 2, you use it to refer to whether it's possible for one given object to not exist. But in premise 3, you use it to refer to everything. Reply. A term isn't ambiguous just because it can be used to refer to different things. The term would only be ambiguous if it was being used to mean different things, and here that's not the case. Objection 2. The third premise commits the fallacy of composition by assuming that if premise 2 is true of a single thing, then it's also true of everything. Reply. The fallacy of composition would only be if I arrived at premise 3 by assuming that because premise 2 is true of each part of existence, then it must be true of the whole of existence as well. That's not the case. Premise 2 is a statement of general truth, not a description of any one specific thing which might not have existed. So, of course, it's true of everything the premise applies to, because the statement is a general one. Objection 3. The first conclusion is guilty of the false cause fallacy, assuming that a necessary thing needs to cause things that might not have existed just because they seem related. Reply. 
I've addressed this kind of objection before, but to sum it up, the false cause fallacy doesn't apply when you're not dealing with two factors which correlate. In this case, the necessarily existing thing isn't a correlating factor, it's just a reasonable explanation for how something could exist without it being necessary for it to exist. So it follows that God must exist if things that could possibly not have existed are going to exist, which is a very good piece of evidence to indicate that God exists. Next time, can the fact that some things are better than others teach us anything about God? That's all for now, so keep asking questions, and thanks for watching.